The very first line of the very first reading that we heard today from the prophet Isaiah, I find to be troubling and a little bit jarring. The Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. Is that disturbing to any of you? The Lord was pleased to crush him in in infirmity. So first of all, the fact that the Lord could be pleased in something like this And secondly, that the Lord would crush him in infirmity. And the prophets here are proclaiming not only what would happen to the prophets at their time, but they're foreshadowing what would happen to Jesus and that he would be crushed in infirmity. So how could the Lord find this pleasing? Suffering in general is a very confusing thing. You know, just the mere fact that God would allow suffering to happen in our world should cause all of us to really struggle with that. Why does God allow suffering? And yet he does, and we've experienced tragic sufferings throughout the course of humanity. You've probably experienced tragic or difficult sufferings in your own life. So why does God allow this? And let alone, how could he be pleased with this? When Viktor Frankl wrote his book, Man's Search for Meaning, in 1946, it became a classic. So if you've never read the book, uh, it's a phenomenal book, and the title is Man's Search for Meaning. So searching for meaning, especially in the midst of suffering. He wrote this book after he was imprisoned in uh, a German concentration camp in World War II. And he was, uh, he's a psychiatrist and was a psychologist, and he studied logotherapy. And logotherapy was particularly searching for the meaning of life. And for him, it would be especially searching for the meaning of suffering. So what is suffering and is there any meaning in suffering? And two of the lines that I'd like to just focus on that he says in the book, one is that those who know, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. Those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. So that means that if we know why, why we live, if we know what our purpose in life is, then we can bear anything that happens to us because we know what our purpose is. We know our why. And the same is true for suffering. If we know the why of suffering, we can stand almost any how of suffering. And so what is the why ultimately of suffering? The second line that he says is, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds meaning, such as the meaning of sacrifice. So that's the key word, sacrifice. The only way that suffering can mean anything to us is sacrifice. The only reason we can read this phrase, the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity, is sacrifice. And it's ultimately this sacrifice that brings meaning to suffering. So I want to make this practical and real for all of us here. How could God be pleased with this? Well, when Jesus came into the world, God sent him into the world so that he could be a savior, our savior, and that he would sacrifice his life for the forgiveness of sins. So the why of Jesus' suffering was for the salvation of the world. That's why he suffered. And so when Jesus was grappling this, with this himself, when he was ultimately uh, preparing to go to the cross, he prayed to God his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass. But not my will, but thy will be done. And so Jesus discerned in, in, this mo- in that moment that it was the Father's will that he should enter into the suffering and death. And from that moment, he knew the meaning. He knew the purpose. And so it made almost anything endurable. And so, because it was God's will that Jesus should suffer and die to free and restore all of us from our sins, can you see how God would be pleased in that? How he would be so pleased that his very own son would be willing to give his life as a ransom for the many. So God was pleased in the sacrifice of his only son. 
because it would mean the salvation of the entire world, and because it would mean that he would follow his will through the greatest suffering and death. So we hear the Lord is pleased to crush him in infirmity. Well, what does it mean to crush? And I think, uh, especially in the, in the sign of Eucharist, when we hear about the cup that Jesus tells the disciples that they will receive, if you think about a grape, a small grape that is crushed, in a sense it's destroyed, but when it is crushed and fermented, it becomes wine. And so Jesus, when he is crushed and suffers and destroyed in death, that suffering and death will become something new. It becomes eternal life. And so God the Father is so pleased with his Son that he would be willing to do that, that he would be willing to give his life to suffer and to die, so pleased that we would cause him to rise. And then we hear in the, a little bit later in the passage, he gives his life as an offering for sin, and he shall see his descendants for a long life. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and the fullness of day. And through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. So the why of Jesus' suffering was to save us and to redeem us from sin. Well, now we get to the question of ourselves. Why do we suffer? And I want you to think particularly on the suffering that you have in your life right now. Maybe this suffering is something that's temporary. Maybe it's recovering from surgery. Maybe this suffering has been ongoing. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's a suffering you've endured your, your entire life. Maybe it's been a, a crippling depression or anxiety. What is your suffering right now? Emotionally, physically, spiritually. Try to think about what that is. Could even be stress about school. Could be difficulties in your life. Do you know the why? Have you ever asked God, why am I suffering this? Probably, like me, you've probably prayed to say, God, get rid of this suffering. I've had enough. I don't want it. Or why, why am I suffering like this when nobody else is? But if you ask them, why in a particular way have you allowed this suffering? We should pray and ask God, like Jesus, to spare us from it. You know, if he can heal us and redeem us or free us from the suffering to do that. But if he doesn't, if he allows it, there's a reason. And the reason ultimately is so that we can participate in the suffering of Jesus. That's the redemptive suffering that Viktor Frankl is talking about. That we can become part of the sacrifice of Jesus. And once we know that there is a purpose for our suffering, that God is permitting or allowing the suffering in your life so that you can unite it to Jesus, that allows us for the how, that we could take any suffering that happens in our lives. But sometimes, and probably most of the time, we never get to this step. We never offer our suffering to Jesus. We don't unite it to Jesus. We don't actually say, Father, if, the, if this be possible, let this cup pass. But if it, it is not, let it be done according to your will. I think what we forget to do is say, God, if this is your will for me to suffer, I accept it and I freely choose to take it on as an offering for your sacrifice. When we do that, suffering becomes transformed. When we do that, we can endure any suffering if we know that it's part of the Lord's suffering, a part of his suffering, dying, and rising. Because when we join our suffering to his, we become one with him in the Paschal mystery. We suffer with him, not alone. We die with him, not alone. And we rise with him, not alone. So I just for a moment want you to think about and call to mind what it is you're suffering. Have you offered that to God yet? Have you accepted it? Have you said, God, I will accept this according to your will? 
the moment we do that, suffering ceases to be suffering, and it transforms it into redemptive sacrifice. And then when we come forward to receive the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the chalice of suffering into us. He's with us in our suffering, and it no longer is meaningless. It no longer is purposeless, but we are a part of God's eternal plan. And just as God the Father was so pleased that Jesus would accept this suffering and do his will, God the Father is so pleased with you that you accept your suffering and do his will. I want you to really hear that and believe that. Whatever your suffering, if you can say, yes, Lord, I accept this and I offer it to you, he will be so pleased with you. And that's where we hear the phrase, and it now makes sense, the Lord is pleased to crush him in infirmity. The Lord is pleased with the sacrifice that Jesus made, and he is so pleased with your sacrifice. He looks at you with great love, great tenderness, great hope, and he says, thank you. Thank you for being willing to carry this sacrifice, not only for yourselves, for your salvation, but for the salvation of all as we unite ourselves to the suffering of Christ.